Reflecting on the Kremlin dynamics behind the bombings we've witnessed all over Ukraine really means understanding that we're looking at a mafia-like authoritarian regime that's struggling for self-preservation through military misadventure, imperial withdrawal syndrome, a leadership that's untethered from reality and from discipline and a traumatized and toxically depoliticized population. I want to give us five basic takeaways from the bombings we've witnessed. Two are plain and generic, but numbers three, four and five take us behind the walls of the Kremlin. The first thing to understand about the bombings we've witnessed is that they are militarily aimless and terroristic. They are targeted at civilians going about their mourning on the way to work, on the way to the park, on the way to an educational institution. That's the first thing to understand about the bombings. They are a return to a strategy of horror, terror, shock, or that the Russians already tried seven months ago. And the second part to understand is that they didn't work back then and they're not going to work now no matter how much Russians intensify them. The key effects will be first that Ukrainians will develop an intergenerational intolerance of all things Russian long after that thing in the Kremlin dies. And second, these bombings will only raise the stakes of intervention and make Ukrainians convinced that they're willing to win at any cost to themselves and at any cost to the world. The third thing to understand about the bombings takes us behind the scenes, and that's that they are a domestic policy move. They are a response to calls for escalation from military radicals on the inside of the Putin regime and Z ultra patriots on the outside of the regime, both calling for blood and escalation. This is barbarism as domestic policy in order to service a decrepit regime that's trying to hold on to an empire that must exist according to fantasists with power who are trying to control history. And this is Putin ceding power in order to retain control. Now that might seem paradoxical, but let's go back to what Putin did at the beginning of the war. One of the consequences of the war in February is that Putin immediately centralized power in his hands, power that was ceding to a complex network of ill-assorted elites around him. Now the war made Putin more central but it also made him more vulnerable. And we're beginning to see that now. This move lets go of power that should be in Putin's hands and gives over initiative to folks trying to exercise various pressures around him. And this is a cycle that may be difficult to reverse. The irreversible bits are really twofold. The ceding of the power could be irreversible. And secondly, the escalation that ensues from that could be irreversible. Because Putin has opened the door to responding to pressure and permitted people to announce that they've succeeded in pressuring a response out of him. Let's have a look at what Tatiana Stanovaya, one of the experts I recommend, says about this today. Putin is becoming a hostage to this situation. And if next time he hesitates, this may already cause genuine irritation on the part of those who are invested in fighting the war to the bitter end. The course of events is developing in such a way that Putin's initiative is weakening and he is becoming more dependent on circumstances and those who are out there trying to procure this victory for him. This again doesn't mean there'll be a coup or an anti-Putin uprising by somebody close to him, but this is a new process that will be extended over time and will slowly erode Putin's authority and narrow the room for maneuver. One of the other consequences is that this may threaten Putin's vision of slowing down and protracting the conflict with the hope that meanwhile the West gives up, Western citizens get fatigue, Western democracies continue to wobble and even begin to partially collapse and generate anti-democratic forces that might be more sympathetic to Putin's aspirations in this conflict. All of this kind of waiting game may further run away from Putin now. One of the shocking things is the degree of gleefulness in response to human suffering that we are now seeing among, above all, these Z 
patriots. Mr. Dugan's response, Dugan is a kind of self-proclaimed philosophizing imperialist, Mr. Dugan's response is a case in point. It's not important because Dugan has influence over Putin. It's important because it's representative of the screeching on the Z ultra patriotic extreme. This is what Mr. Dugan has managed to come up with today. This is a new stage which has begun for the Ukrainian terrorist state. In the center of Kiev, it's unsafe again, which is obviously great for him. And cruise missiles are hitting the Ukrainian capital, which he also loves. Today's strikes aren't just a serious strategic operation, but they're also the effect of enormous psychological pressure put on Ukrainians. So, Dugan goes on, dear Ukrainians, consider how much a harmless postage stamp with the Crimean bridge can cost you, which, by the way, is still in operation. Dugan cry cried about the bridge, but is now happy that it's partially restored. And of course, Mr. Dugan can't end, end without a Duganism. Our heroes are alive even when they are dead. Your heroes are dead even when they are as yet alive. This is a war in the spirit world. That's great, Mr. Dugan. That's really great. The one who is on the side of light is the light. The one who is on the side of darkness is a non entity. This is doubly disgraceful from Mr. Dugan. It's disgraceful first because he is taking joy in the suffering and death of innocent people. But okay, there could be a philosopher who wishes evil. But in a second way, he's even more disgraceful, qua philosopher. And that's because he thinks that killing innocent Ukrainians is a tactic that works to further his spiritual and political project. A project that will presumably be erected on the bones of dead Ukrainians conquered by a military that Mr. Dugan's favorite regime doesn't even have. This is mindless imperialist nostalgia. To understand how far it might affect the Russian population, we need to wait and see. Just a couple of days ago, political expert Andrei Kolesnikov spoke about the terrible pride of Russians for their country's self-destructive power. But there are grounds for optimism. Putin's already broken a bond with his population by ordering mobilization and the population may be partially waking up. Meanwhile, to understand why this imperialist nostalgia is so intellectually empty, watch this video about the fallout from the killing of Mr. Dugan's daughter, Daria Dugan, a few weeks ago.